Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome on this new live session uh, organized by DXO. I am Julian, your host. Um, first of all, I hope you are doing well and hope that uh, you are getting ready for the holiday season and you're going to take some beautiful pictures. So today we wanted to talk with you about uh, DXO Film Pack 6. As you know, we released this new version of the software at the end of October, um, so nearly two months ago, and we have many things to say about it. Uh, we won't be able to talk about all the new features that we have in this new software, but we're going to go through uh, the black and white part. And for this, um, I will have a guest that you know very well, who is uh, Joseph. I can see Joseph behind his camera. He's waiting for us. He's smiling and you won't see him for the moment, but in a few seconds. So today we wanted to once again talk about black and white photography and we're going to focus a little bit about Kodak Trix um, photo. So I'm going to show you this uh, very well-known uh, film negative who has been used by many photographers in the past. And for this, uh, I'm gonna show you also some example of photography that has been made with this beautiful um, film, Sebastiao Salgado. So uh, we really like his work and we know that uh, for some of his work, he's been using DxO Film Pack, I think it was version five or even four in the past, but he has been using it because he knows that he can find the film that he used to use in the past when he was doing film photography. Uh, let's be clear, he still used film photography. So some picture of uh, Sebastiao, this one is beautiful. We've got another one, which is this one. So Sebastiao Salgado is a we know in a documentary photographer and photojournalist with a deep love and respect for nature while also sensitive to the socio-economic condition that impact human beings. He has traveled to over 120 countries for his projects. So I'm quite sure most of you know him, but if you don't, try to find a book uh, and it's Christmas time very soon. So. Uh, I think you can ask to your beloved to offer you a book for Christmas about uh, Henri cartier bresson or even Sebastiano Salgado. A few other pictures. This one is a gorgeous picture. And the last one I'm going to show you, it's this one. Uh, I mean, the black and white is gorgeous. The tonality, the gray, it's, it's an amazing picture. Um, I'm not going to talk any longer because we have Joseph waiting just behind. Hello, Joseph. How Good are you? morning. Yeah, morning. It's still morning for you. <laughs> it's morning and it's cold here. So if you guys see me shivering, it's because it's snowing outside and I accidentally turned my heat off last night and for it or I accidentally didn't turn it back on, I should say. So a little chilly in here this morning. Get warmer during this live. I'm sure you will. 
Um, <laughs> once again, I'm not going to talk any longer. Uh, you are the expert of the DxO Film Pack 6 and other software from DxO, and we will talk about other software in 2022. So this is going to be the last live session for 2021 because uh, we're going to go on holidays for some of you, some of us at the office. Uh, but I'm going on holiday next week and I'm very excited about this. Uh, so now, uh, Joseph, uh, I'm going to leave you the screen. Uh, you're going to be on your own right now. And uh, All right. we are listening very carefully. Thank you very much. And also, I want to remind everybody that if you are, for those of you who are watching live right now, uh, please do post your questions and we'll try to get to them at the end if we can. So um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Photo Joseph, and I'm going to take you on a little bit of a tour of Film Pack, specifically focusing on black and white photography. And even more specifically, we're going to be diving a little bit into that Triax film that we saw in the beginning. But before I even get into it, I just wanted to kind of a high level overview thought concept of black and white and specifically film photography and why as modern digital photographers, we care. Because to some degree, you have to think, well, hold on, why does it matter anymore? We're not shooting film, at least most of us aren't. We're shooting digital. Why do we have this obsession with film, with black and white film, with a particular film stock and so on? Is it just nostalgia? Is it just because we we yearn for a day of shooting film and having to spend all that money on buying film and, and then cross, spending money on processing it and waiting to get the photos back from the lab? Is that what we're missing? And I think the simple answer to that is no. no most of us aren't pining for spending more money and waiting around to see our photos. I think for most of us, and I know for me personally, it is very much about the character, the the uniqueness of film, the soul. I always say that I feel like digital photography is lacking in soul and adding just a little bit of texture, a little bit of grain back into it, just brings some of that back. And of course, you get all of that out of film. And in Film Pack, you're getting that through the film emulations. What you'll find in Film Pack, if you've never seen it before, is dozens and dozens of different films that are being emulated. The idea being that we're trying to reproduce on screen digitally as close as possible to what you would have gotten if you had shot film. If you had taken film, a film camera and shot this scene, how would it reproduce? And it's not just about the grain. The grain is just one very small part of it. When you talk about different film stocks, you're talking about different responses to different lights, different amounts of light, how bright or dark that is represented on film. The curve, what we would call today a gamma curve, or what was then called a tone curve of how the shadows are reacting. Are the shadows darker? Are the shadows lighter? Are the highlights lighter or darker? Where do the mid-tones fall? Does middle gray look a little bit brighter, a little bit darker with this film stock? And photographers back in the day would get used to shooting a particular type of film that they might fall in love with. They go, I love the look of this film. And they would understand that film and when they shot, they knew what they were going to get. They knew that maybe a shadow like this would get crushed. So maybe I'm going to overexpose the photo a little bit and all this is happening without being able to look at the back of your camera and see if you got it or not you just had to know and it took time and experience and all of that is wonderful in how it makes the images look and today we have the advantage of kind of the best of both worlds because we can shoot digitally we can see exactly what we got immediately and then we can take it into software and we can apply a film stock and we can try different film looks different film stocks different film grains different film response curves after the fact, and then we can modify them in ways that were never possible back in the days of pure film. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there as a, as a concept of why we even bother talking about this. Because again, at the end of the day, you might think, well, it just doesn't matter. It's digital, make the black and white look however you want, but this is a way to get something that is a starting point of the way it used to be, the way that uh, maybe you never would have thought of, and then to dive through that and come up with some creative concepts for your own photos. So with all that said, let's go into Film Pack. Let's get my screen up there on the screen and waiting to see my screen on the screen. Julian, you want to share my screen? There we go. There's my screen. There's me in the corner. And uh, this is the interface that you see when you first launch it. it. Actually, when you very first launch, it'll show you some default photos. But to look at your own photos, click on this little folder icon up here in the top left. And then it's just going to open up your system and you can, you know, on Mac or Windows, you're going to navigate to the folder that you want to look at. Also, I should point out that you can, of course, open photos from other apps inside of Filmpack and how you get there will just depend on the app that you're using. If you're using 
uh, photo lab, of course, then there is a send to film pack. If you're using Lightroom, it would open in film pack. If you're using Photoshop, it acts as a plugin. There's a lot of different ways to get there, but you can always get there. Or as I'm doing here, you can just start with film pack and open a raw file and start from here. So that's what we're doing. All right, so I've got these photos here. I'm going to start with this one. This is a photo that I shot in India a while ago, and I'm, I'm using this one because there's so many colors in here, and you'll be able to very easily see how different film stocks react to the different colors. Now, we want to focus specifically on black and white, but I have a few different ways to get there. And I'm going to start with something called Time Machine, which is a really fun feature inside of Film Pack 6. Over here in the top right, there's this little button that says Time Machine. When I click on that, it loads up a load of presets, it loads up a load, a list of eras. You can see them by decade, the 1900s, 1910s, and so on. And then on the left-hand side, you'll see a collection of historical photos. So this is a really cool way to find a different photo look, but also to learn something about photography. So let's just start with the 1900s. I click on the 1900s, and we'll see a list of presets here of looks from the 1900s. And you might find it curious that there's a few color looks in here. There were some interesting experiments with color, but also a lot of hand painting and color back then. Um, as we go a little bit forward, we'll actually run into more black and white before we get back into color. And since we are focusing on black and white, let's start here in the 1910s. When I click on the 1910s here, over on the left, we have this list of photos, historical photos that were shot in that decade. And you'll see on here, obviously, you look at the photo, you can see a little description about it. If I click on this, it'll open up bigger. And we see a very interesting historical lesson here written out for us. These are unique little history lessons about those photos that have been written specifically for this software. And it's really cool just to learn a bit about photography this way. But you'll also notice down at the bottom of each of these, there's a little text that says matching renderings and then something underneath it that tells you what preset. Now I'll tell you if you are not new to Film Pack 6, if you've already used it before in the past, but you haven't updated the free update to 6.1, I believe it is, um, then you haven't seen this yet. These little lists down here are now actually buttons. So when I click on one of these, it's going to load that preset. So if I decided that I wanted this look, I can simply click on that button there and it loads that preset. Now this particular preset might not necessarily work great for this photo, and that's fine. That's part of the exploration process, finding a look that matches or that works with your photo. Now, of course, we can go in and modify this, and we will in a moment. Um, if you really love this, but you, like in this particular case, it's a little bit too overexposed, of course, we can pull that back as well. But I just want to start with some of the presets. So again, I can click on one of these, see the example up here, click on the button down here to load that up, or I can simply click on the button directly in this list. So if I go down here to say this one, click on that, it will load up that preset. So and again, going through these different eras, you'll find tons and tons of different black and white examples. On the left, we're seeing the historical photo. On the right, we're seeing a preview of what that preset will look like applied to our photo. And it's a great way to go about finding those black and whites. Now, this is just one way of doing it. And of course, here we're, we're mixing up the black and whites and the colors. Let's say that you really just want to focus on the black and white. Okay. Well, over here, we have this thing called filter. And this is going to show us, first of all, all of the presets that we have. And you'll see up here in the top right, maybe a little hard to see through the webinar screen here, but it says 214 out of 214. So there's 214 different presets that are included in here. Okay, um, but what if I just want black and white? Well, when I click on the filter button, I can filter by just color, or in this case, just black and white. So just black and white. Right now we're down to 55. So 55 of the presets are just black and white. Maybe I wanna see just the black and whites that were part of Time Machine. I can add that to the filter list, and um, curiously, it shows there's none. <laughs> we'll come back to that later. Um, let's go for a black and white legacy negative film. So I'll select that, and now we're down to a selection of 36 of them. We can go through other presets in here, other uh, filter collections, but let's just limit it to this. So 36 different presets that are all black and white to look at. And if we look at these names, you'll see that a lot of these are named after a film stock. So like this is the ADOX CHS film. I can scroll down here and find an Ilford HPS 800, load that up. And we can see exactly what that would look like in here. Now, each one of these you might've noticed is opening up a window on the left-hand side, a little info panel that is showing us some information about the photo. I'm sorry, about the film stock. Like we had info about the photo before, now we're reading about that film stock, a bit of history about it, uh, maybe some information of of what the grain pattern should be like or where it was used historically. Just again, some very nice information in here. 
You can get rid of this by simply clicking the close button. And I'll show you this because I think this a lot of people run into this. You don't want this popping up each time, right? I, I click on close and then I go to another one and it pops open again. That's awesome. But at some point you're done seeing that. So I can click this button here that says show description automatically. I can just turn that off. And now whenever I click on one, it's not going to bring it up. If I do want to uh, bring up that description, then on the bottom left of each preset, there's a little I button. Click on that and it'll open it up. And from there, I can go ahead and turn show description automatically back on if I wanted to. But I'm going to leave that off just because I don't want those popping up every time. And again, going through here, I can find all the different presets. Now, let's say that I'm looking for a very specific preset. In this case, I'm going to look for something done with Tri-X because that's the film that we're kind of featuring today, if you will. So I'm going to search for my Tri-X presets. To do that, I have a search window up here, a little magnifying glass. I can type on there and now I can type in exactly what I want. So I start typing in try and there it is. There is our Tri-X 400. So I select that and it applies that preset. Again, we can get some information about that film stock if we want in here. It's kind of interesting. We see that it was first produced in 1954. So it's been around for a while. Um, and it's oh, end of production. It's still available. So you can actually still buy Tri-X 400 today. Very cool. I actually didn't know that. And so um, anyway, so we've got this preset in here. We load this up and you go, OK, this is this is great. You know, I really like the look of this but the shadows are a little bit too crunchy, a little bit too dark on here. I need to boost them up a little bit. Well, of course we can continue to, or we can edit the preset. We can modify the photo just like you would with any digital app as you can go in and start tweaking the photo, raise the shadows and so on. So to do that, I'll click on this button here. This is gonna take me over to my full editor. And from here, I have access to all the different tools that I might wanna play with. You'll notice, first of all, at the top, there is a rendering. And the rendering is the, uh, again, talking about that film response curve, the gamma curve, this is going to show you all the different film stocks that are built into here. So even though we started with the, the Tri-X on there that we started with, we can go ahead and select any one. So I could say, what would a T-Max look like? Or what would a uh, Polaroid 672 look like? And you can, as I do this, you can see, and this is why I selected this photo, you can see how the different film stocks are going to react differently to the colors and to the overall tonality. So if you if you look up here, let me just hit the compare button so we see the colors. You'll see that there's uh, there's reds and oranges and purples and blues in here. There's a lot of different colors happening just in the top half of the photo alone. And of course, down at the bottom, we're seeing the skin tone on the woman there. We're seeing the purple wall. We see the blue on the basket that she's holding there. So pretty much most colors of the rainbow are being represented here. So as I go through these and I choose the different film stocks, we can see that how some of them are gonna make the reds a little bit brighter. Some of them are gonna make the blues a little bit darker. It's just very dependent on how that film was designed. And some of them are gonna be dramatically different in here. So let's go back to that Tri-X 400 again. And I'll come back to intensity in a moment here. Scrolling down a little bit farther, you'll see there's grain. Grain of the Kodak Tri-X 400 again you can actually detach these and have a different grain pattern from you know a grain pattern from one film stock combined with a response curve of another one so let's say that i i don't like the grain pattern of triax 400 but i love the one of tmax 3200 so now i'm combining those two and if you're going to play with grain you really do want to go in one to one on there so you can very clearly see what's happening and this is going to be a level of subtlety that might be a little bit hard to appreciate through the webinar here, but certainly once you start playing with it on your own screen, you'll be able to see the subtleties a lot more. But just to kind of go through some of them, if I take the intensity of this and I crank it way up, we're going to get a really strong grain pattern. I mean, you can see on here, this grain pattern has very dark points on it. Lots and lots of very, very dark points. Let's actually switch this back to the original Tri-X 400. And a lot of those really dark points fall away. These are no longer as visible. It's just not as contrasty of a grain pattern. And of course, I can drag the intensity down on that to make it a little bit more subtle, a little bit lighter. Let's bring it down here so we're looking more at her face while I adjust the grain on there. So intensity way down, or again, bring the intensity way back up, and you can see that grain showing up everywhere. Here's a really cool feature. You have the ability here to choose what type of film, what size of film 
the grain is being modeled after. Because of course, if you're shooting on 35 millimeter medium format or large format, that's going to change. So this 24 by 36, that's actually, that means 35 millimeter film. I could look at what medium format film would look like and we're gonna see the grain get less because that's the nature of larger negative. Um, and then I can go to large format, even less because again, the nature of a larger negative. But I can also make my own custom one. I can just go custom here and then I can change the grain size to make it bigger or smaller, depending on my personal tastes in here. So lots of different ideas of how you can swipe through or swap through different renderings of film stocks and of course the different grains. Underneath this, we have a ton of control over the image. And, and I'm gonna come back to this in a moment, but I wanna show you a different way that we can go about creating a film stock. We don't have to start with just a preset. We can start totally from scratch. So let's do that. I'll go back to this menu and there's an option under here called new. Oh, by the way, all these presets in here that uh, rather filters that I have either clicked on or typed in to get rid of any of them, I can just click on that. You see a little line goes through it as I hover over it and that will clear that out. So now I'm back to looking at all presets, but I wanna, I wanna create a new one. So I click on new and it goes to the edit menu that we were just in, but everything is at default. There is nothing being applied anywhere. You'll see under film rendering, it says no rendering, grain, no grain. And if we scroll through here, everything is, is at its default. So we are basically, we're looking at the original image minus the lens correction. You can actually see a little bit of distortion and vignette correction happening there. Let's zoom back out. Um, that is because Film Pack is using the same DxO film modules, uh, 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 camera modules that are part of PhotoLab. So when you first load up a photo, it's gonna tell you there's automatic corrections to be applied. You can apply them. If you do wanna turn that off, if you wanted to go back to a totally native file, you could do that. If you scroll down, you will find here automated corrections. So I could turn off the optical corrections, the color corrections and so on in here if I wanted to. But I'm gonna go ahead and leave those on because in general, those are pretty good to have. Okay, so back up to the top, I'm creating a brand new preset from scratch. I can click on film rendering and I can choose from what are called digital films, cinematic films, color slides, color negative films, and so on. And if we keep going down here, we're going to find, uh, or I guess it's under the color negatives, we're going to find our black and whites. Or what I could do is simply click on black and white, and now everything is limited to just the black and white options. So if I scroll back up, here's just black and white films, and we'll see all of these black and whites in here. So there we go. So we'll find these, and let's go back to that same Tri-X from before. We're going to go ahead and stick with that Tri-X theme. So I load up that Tri-X 400. I can play with the intensity of that. How intense do I want that to be? If I bring it down, we are basically going back to our default photo without a rendering being applied to it. And if I take it all the way up, we're kind of doubling up on the intensity of the original film stock. So if you have some look that you like, but you just want a little bit more of that look, we can dial that up a bit. But I'm gonna go ahead and leave this at the default of 100. By the way, if you just double click on the little slider, it'll reset back to its original position. And I do like grain, so I'm gonna choose grain. Instead of going through the list and trying to find that same one, there's an option at the top here for current film rendering. So it will just automatically load up the film rendering that matches, uh, sorry, the film grain that matches the film rendering, which is nice too, because if you're switching through different film stocks in here, it is going to automatically load up the film rendering to go with that. So let's go back to that Tri-X 400 again. And uh, let's let's leave that one as it is. But looking at this photo, as I had said in the beginning, when I pulled up this first preset, I said, you know, my shadows are a little bit much, a little bit dark in here. So there's a lot of different ways I can approach this. I could go in and start playing with my exposure. Let's just start really basic. We've got our exposure slider in here. Of course, as you would expect to find, you have your contrast. We can increase or decrease contrast in there, which might be a, a good way to go, honestly, because there's so much darkness in this photo, in the, in the door here and in the shadows over here and so on. I can adjust midtones, highlights, and so on, as you would expect in any other piece of software. Um, but this is where things get really interesting. Scroll down a little bit more, we get to the channel mixer. So the channel mixer is going to allow us to brighten or darken particular color ranges in the photo. Now, right now, we don't know what those color ranges are because we're looking at it in black and white. But if I go up to the compare menu and I hold that, now I can see once again, the original colors. So let's say that I want to play with that wall in the background. It's kind of a purplish bluish color. Um, I maybe want to make it a little bit brighter, a little bit darker. So I go down here to my channel mixer and I look for the closest color. It's probably in blue. It might be a little bit in cyan, a little bit magenta, but it's probably in blue. So I'll take blue here, here and I'll start to drag that down to darken it. And we are seeing, well, we're not seeing the wall darken. We're seeing her basket darken. 
Okay, so I guess it's not in that range. We're seeing a little bit of the edge of the wall. So maybe I'll pull it down a little bit, but let's go to cyan and see if that's where it lives. And I pull that down and there's some of the shadows on the walls coming around, pull some of the magenta down. And between all of those, we start to find that that color in there is a mix of those. And so we can really start to tweak that in and darken or brighten that wall. Let's go back to the color in the saris. Let's, uh, red is a pretty prominent color in here. So let's take the red slider here and maybe I wanna make the reds a little bit darker. No, that doesn't work. How about I make the reds a little bit brighter, make them stand out a little bit more. Maybe the yellows. Let's see what happens if I play with the yellow sliders. Oh, that's pretty cool. We can really start to see some of the details popping out of the saris in here. Let's go back to the original. And sure enough, I can't point while I'm holding the mouse down, but it, you can clearly see there's quite some splashes of yellow on your screen. If you look at the sari that's right in the middle, ever so slightly to the right, you can see that there's a lot of little yellow pieces in there. I guess those are flowers on there or little petals that are bright yellow. So if I go in here and I start adjusting the yellow on here, we'll see how those individually start to brighten up and we can really get some interesting looks out of this and really just dial in the look the way that you want it. If we keep scrolling down, you'll find other corrections in here that you can do, your basic tone curve. So maybe I want to just lighten up all the shadows a little bit, pull the highlights down a little bit or go the other way. Let's go for a standard S curve and crunch our shadows and pump up our highlights. We have all of this standard control in here. So you really have a lot of very cool ways to go about making the photo look totally unique and look the way that you want it to look in here. You wanna lift your blacks, give yourself a little bit of a flat look on there. Let's pull up the black point on there a bit, maybe a little bit higher on there, raise that up. And now we've got a little bit of a faded black look. Really, again, you can do absolutely anything in here. It's just very, very cool. Okay, let me um, wrap this up by going through a couple of other photos and applying a couple of different looks on here just to get some ideas of different things that you can really get out of the software. If I wanted to save this, by the way, I can go in here and just save image as, and it's going to create a, uh, a TIFF or JPEG of that. If I wanted to save this look to come back to later, I can create my own preset. That's this button up here. Click on that and I can call it, uh, what's this? Let's do try X modified. Can uh, I you guess hear I me, Joseph? There, try X modified. Click OK. Can you hear me? Yes, I do hear you. Sorry. Oh, good, good, good. I have a question before you, you go further. Uh, sure. Maybe it would be interesting to answer this one uh, and others. Uh, so we have someone, I think it's uh, Paul from uh, Portugal, if I'm right. Does the order in which we select the different comments matter? The order in which we select the different... Command. I mean... Commands. Oh, yeah. okay. No, it doesn't matter at all. So if you, so the question is basically, what does the order that you apply different effect in matter? And it doesn't. And here I'll, I'll show you this in an effective way. I'm going to go in here and let's take the, uh, the exposure and I'll take it way up. Okay, so I've clearly overexposed the image in here. And now I'll go to my tone curves and let me just reset this and I'll bring this way down. And let's say I've played around and I've ended up with this solarized thing and I'm going, well, that doesn't, that doesn't work. Um, I wish I hadn't brought my exposure way down. Well, if I go back up here and I take the exposure down, it is restoring what I had. It is not going to, uh, it's not kind of exposing it, bringing it up and then pulling it back down again. We are undoing the pulling of it back down. Because these sliders are all live, if you will, they're all being rendered live to the screen. It doesn't matter what order you do them. Now you will find that one, adjustment might counteract the effect of another one. Let's say you bring up the exposure and then you do something else and you find that your image gets a little bit darker or maybe gets a little bit brighter. Uh, brighter is a good example. So you bring up the exposure and then you do something else and the image is now too bright. Well, you can leave that something else that you did alone, go back to the original exposure slider and pull it back down. And it's the same as if you had done the other thing first and then adjusted the exposure. So the order absolutely doesn't matter. Thank you for asking. That's a really good question. Really good question. You're welcome. Okay, let's uh, let's go out of here. So as I showed you how to save a preset, I showed you how to save the image. I'm not gonna save this one. I'm going to load up a different photo here. This is a, a studio photo that I shot quite a few years ago of a ballerina. And you can see that she has this uh, powder on her that as she's jumping up, her hair is bouncing up in the air. And there's this powder that is just barely visible down here on the bottom. And I really, in fact, it might not even be visible on your end right now. I really want to accentuate that powder and really pop that out. So I don't know which preset is going to best show this. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump into my 
preset list and let's just look at black and whites. And I'll scroll back up to the top of this and I can just start going through these different preset options in here. I can click on one and it's going to load up, of course, and I can see what that looks like. And I can do this. I keep going through each one, one at a time. I do have this thumbnail icon, which shows me what it's going to look like. It's a little small, but it shows me what it's going to look like. But here's something that's kind of cool. If I go up here to the view menu, I can say display presets on one column. And now my presets get a little bit bigger. I can even take this adjustment here, this window and make that bigger. And now I get really big presets, th uh, preset thumbnails. On this screen resolution, I'm seeing almost the full size image in here as a thumbnail, which is a pretty great way to quickly go through and see different presets and what they might look like in here. So I can scroll through and I can find just a lot of different cool black and white looks. This cappuccino one looks kind of cool. But again, I'm, I'm losing all of that texture down at the bottom. This Delta one, now there, now we're getting somewhere. That's starting to show it. So now I see some really good, really good texture down here. Um, I can try some other ones, or maybe I just want to take this one and enhance it further. So let's go back into the editor. And now on this particular preset, you'll see that this preset is not just the film stock. I remember this one was called, actually, what was it called? <laughs> I forgot. It's called uh, Espresso. Is that the one? No, that's not the one that I loaded. Delta. It was Delta something. Um, it's called Delta. Okay. So that's what this is. But if I look at the full details of it, uh, it's Ilford Delta 400. But look, it's been combined with the T-Max film grain. So it's a combination of the film grains from one film and the renderings from another. And as I keep scrolling down here, you'll see that, oh, well, look, there's contrast and micro contrast added. Someone's pulled the reds down and the cyan and the blues down. Very interesting. Well, I know that her, her leotard is red, so maybe I could brighten that up a little bit. Yeah, we can pull some of the color back in, brighten up some of that leotard in there. So I might want to do that. But what I really want is to focus on that, uh, the powder in there. So I'm going to take my highlights up a little bit and I'm going to take my micro contrast and my fine contrast and really start to crank those up and look at all that coming through down here. Now that might be a little bit too much in there, but you can see how we can go about doing this and really exploring the tools to find the look that works on here. Let's do one more thing. Let's add a frame to this. Um, actually, no, I'm not going to add a frame to this one. I'm going to do one more photo and we'll add a frame to that one. And this will be our last one. We jump into this one, which is, uh, um, another photo from India. You can see here, this is, this is early morning. This is sunrise It's fortunately very, very polluted here. So we had a very kind of misty look. They timed it just right to get the bird in front of the sun there. That was kind of fun, but I want to do more to it. Now, this is a type of photo that you could easily believe was shot in just about any era other than maybe the orange life jacket on there. Um, this should have, could have been shot a very long time ago. So let's go into, let's go into the um, time machine to explore some options in here. And I'm going to go back to my smaller preset thumbnails. Um, oh, I guess it doesn't matter on this one. And let's just shrink this down a little bit. And I'm going to start going through the different preset options in here. And there's some that are not so black and white, but I know that in here, I'm going to find some really cool black and white ones. Let's jump into that 1910s era again and find something like maybe this one here, 1910i. That's kind of very old looking in there. Now we can't, we no longer can see the orange of their life jacket. So now this becomes a bit believable. And this is part of a frame. So if I go back into the editor here and we go down to frames, um, you can see that this has something called a glass black and white frame on it. So that's a frame that's been added. I can change the size of that frame on there if I want to and bring that down a little bit smaller, change the position of it, um, or just choose a different frame. Maybe I want something different on there to combine with that film look. So the frames are a fun way to go. And I think that um, in a future show, we're going to be diving deep into frames and textures and light leaks and things like that that we're not going to play with today. But I wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of some of the other things that are in there. So that's the stuff that I wanted to show you. Julian, do we have any other questions that we want to address uh, yes, before we, we uh, jump? So, as you said, we will uh, have another live in 2022 where we will be talking about frame, light leaks, and other stuff that we can find in the Exo Film Pack 6. Uh, the question that I have uh, from Robert, is it possible to combine two presets? Mm. To combine two presets? No, there's there's not. And here's why that wouldn't work if you had if you happen to have a preset that let's say uh all it did was choose a film stock and then you had another preset that's all it did was choose a film grain then those could be combined you can't but those could technically be combined but the thing is that most presets are a combination of a variety of sliders where the highlights been shifted the contrast has been shifted 
um, there's a film stock chosen and a film grain chosen. And so if you load one and then another, well, which one would get priority? So the you can't really combine them that way. If there's something about a preset that you really like, like let's say the um, the micro contrast that we saw in that one. So let's use that photo of the ballerina as an example. I go through the presets and I finally find a preset that really makes the grain pop out. And I go, okay, that's what I want, but I don't like the coloring of this. I want a different coloring. Well, now I can go into the effects panel, go into this room right here, this panel right here, and I can just start turning things on and off or adjusting sliders to figure out where that grain or that um, that powder enhancement is coming from. Where did that detail come from? Is it the exposure? No, it wasn't exposure. Was it contrast? No, it wasn't contrast. Was it micro contrast? Oh, there it was. That's where it was coming from. So now I know where it's coming from. So now I can go to another preset where I like the look and go now to that micro contrast slider and adjust it and get it that way. So you can't combine them in the sense of load preset one and preset two because there'd be way too much conflicting information for that to work. But you can easily reverse engineer, reverse engineer a preset by simply dragging the sliders up and down to see what is making that that effect that you particularly like that you're attracted to in there and then recreating that yourself in another one. I think that's a good answer. Another question uh, from Sigrid. Uh, Hello, should I do the white balance before or after applying the thin preset? So if you're if you're applying a preset, actually using the presets, then you will need to do the white balance after because the preset will undo any white balancing exposure adjustment that you might have done before. So in that regard, you'd have to do it afterwards. If, however, you are building your own preset from scratch, you're just you're just starting from a blank canvas. As I said, if we went up to here and I said, go new, and I'm just going to go in here and start applying things, then you certainly can do your white balance in advance. Now, if you're doing black and white, then the white balance isn't going to matter. Um, I mean, I guess there's some extreme cases where it might, but in general, it's not going to matter. But of course, in color, it would. So if you wanted to do a Let's go back to a brightly colored image in here. This one, um, actually, in fact, let's do let's do this one because there's a lot of blue in here to, to look at. If I was to um, shift the, let's see here, where are we? Where is it going to be? Um, exposure saturation vibrancy, hue saturation. I'm trying to figure out where. Maybe there isn't a direct white balance I'm, control I'm in here. Thinking about it, and I think there isn't a direct white balance. Tool. There may not be a direct white balance yeah. in here. Okay. Okay, so um, there's not a direct white balance. There are color things that you can do to shift the white, of course. You could go into the HSL and you could take, like, say, the yellow channel and make that more or less saturated. Um, and again, in that case, it wouldn't really matter when you do it because um, it's not going to get overwritten. If, you, if I do this change here and then I go up and I choose a film stock, um, so we're going to do, do just some random color negative film stock, it's not going to undo the work that I did here. But if I chose it from a preset, then it would. Now, if you do have an image that needs serious white or needs white balance correction, you can do that in Photo Lab or Photoshop or Lightroom or uh, you know, any whatever app or Apple Photos, whatever app you're using, do the white balance correction and then send it over. Because think of Film Pack more as a finishing tool for most photos. So if you were doing retouching, for example, you don't have that tool in Film Pack. So you would do your retouching before you got here. White balance is a good base a uh, base adjustment that you would want to do before you got here. So in that case, you would do that in your host app and then send the image over. Um, that's how I would handle that. I didn't realize there wasn't any white balance in there. I wouldn't have started going down that train of thought before uh, before I got there. So thanks for it. Now I learned something today too. <laughs> okay, last question. And then I think uh, we will uh, end of this uh, live. So we have a question from Alexander. Uh, I think he's in France. Uh, nice. How did you proceed to digitally emulate these films rendering? Uh, How were these rendered? So this is this is uh, Julian. You might be able to speak to this more than I can, but this is something that Photo Lab, uh, that DxO Labs have been working on for years and years and years. Yeah, yeah. And there, it's a combination of scanning actual negatives and getting from you know real film to get that green pattern, and then meticulously figuring out. Uh, how a particular film stock reacted to particular light and colors in the real world. Um, you, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, well, so basically, uh, we bought many film stock in the past and we still 
buying uh, some of Julie, that. sorry, Julie, why don't you bring up the image of us? If people are still looking oh, yeah, at the sorry. screen. Uh, there we are. So basically, uh, as I said, we bought many film stocks in the past and we are continuing to, to do so. And I saw some new film stock in the laboratory a few days ago and I'm very excited about it because we're going to put them into a Rolleiflex camera, a six by six. So it's going to be a fun time. Um, basically, uh, we took many pictures inside the laboratory. So you can see behind me, we've got a scene that we are using to take some picture with the uh, latest camera that we receive. And uh, I just want to say something because we had a question on social network about some people who received their Sony Alpha 7 IV, Lucky Boys, because it's going to be hard to, to get them. So we received it and we're going to work on it to uh, deliver the support of this new camera. So behind me, there's a scene uh, that we are using for digital and also for uh, analog film. So we are taking a lot of pictures inside uh, the office and also outside with different setting uh, on the camera. Once it's done, we develop the film, we scan it, and then we reproduce as close as possible the result that we have uh, uh, from the laboratory that work with us on this uh, project. So I think it's a clear answer. It's a lot of work. Uh, it's uh, something that has been doing for the past 18 years at DxO. <laughs> so we know very well uh, film stock uh, and other stuff about photography. But uh, yes, we, we, we are taking a lot, a lot of pictures every year with digital camera and also with a uh, film camera. I hope I answered the question. Uh, maybe you learned something for once from me, <laughs> Joseph. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoyed this live that we had uh, right now. Uh, we will be back next year. Um, what else can I say to you? We are running our special holiday season offer at the moment until December 29. And you can get up to 30% on every software from the XO. So it's including the XO Film Pack 6, but you can also have this uh, promo uh, code on the XO Puro, which is a fantastic software to edit, uh, to start editing your files. Um, into the XO Photolab 5 maybe or other software that I won't talk about. <laughs> and then we also have the new Nick Collection 4 and uh, what else? I think I said everything. The XO Pro, the XO Photolab 5, the XO Film Pack 6 and the Nick Collection that has eight software inside them. Nick Silver FX, Color FX Pro, Nick uh, Analog FX and so on and so on. And I'm sure we will have other life. Uh, live, sorry, uh, to talk about the new collection and other software. So uh, stay tuned. We will share on social media and other places by mail. Um, we will find a way to send you the news and let you know when we are live and what will the topic be. Joseph, thank you for your time. Hope you're a bit uh, warmer than at the beginning of the live. Not much. The snow is really coming down out there right now, so. It's definitely chilly here today. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, have a coffee, a cup of tea, whatever, get, get warmer, and uh, it will be better later. Take care of yourself, Super. guys. Thank you very much. Jose, thanks again. And uh, thank you. see you soon, very quickly, hopefully. All right. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year.